Um, okay, well, today's talk is by Lou. Um, and he has some things up his sleeve to tell you. Right. So this talk is an elementary talk about Clifford algebras. And I thought that I would start by talking about quaternions and octonions for a little while and the and the and the Cayley Dixon construction because what I wanted to show you is an elementary uh, kind of analog of the Cayley Dixon construction that makes Clifford algebras instead of other algebras. So so this this first piece of slideshow is about quaternions and octonions, as you'll see. Um, so you will recall the quaternions, which were summarized by Hamilton with this equation here, I squared J squared and K squared are minus one, and so is I J K, and it's an associative algebra. Um, and this clip here is a clip from an Escher drawing. I should have checked the, uh, what larger Escher drawing this is from. Uh, but one of the reasons I liked it is because of the virtual crossings here that Escher invented. So um, this proves that Escher is actually the inventor of virtual knot theory. Um, here's an Irish stamp. Uh, uh, and this is a reproduction of Hamilton's writing uh, uh, with the quaternion relations. I believe as found on the bridge in Dublin, um, where he wrote them when he discovered them. And another stamp. Um, and I like this quote. Uh, so he, he had worked on them for a long time and finally got them in 1843. And the story goes that he was uh, walking with his wife along the Royal Canal to a meeting of the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin, and he made the discovery, and he said, or wrote, that is to say, I then and there felt the galvanic circuit of thought close, and the sparks which fell from it were the fundamental equations between I, J, and K, exactly such as I have used them ever since, and carved the equations on the bridge. The bridge. I've never been to Dublin. I uh, hope someday to actually see this bridge. Probably many of you have been there from Dublin, Ireland. Surely some of I, you. Have. I have, yes. I believe the you can't actually see the uh, scratches now. Probably uh, not. Time has worn them off. Yes. And people probably touching the foot. Yes. I've been to Dublin many times, but <laughs> never seen the bridge. So uh -huh. Huh. I've seen the canal, but not the bridge. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, of course, out of that discovery came uh, many elements of what we think of as, or, as normal vector analysis, such as dot products and cross products and so on. And in fact, you can define the quaternion multiplication by for two vectors in three space, you get a scalar when you multiply them, like I squared is minus one. Um, uh, but the full formula is uh, the product of two vectors is equal to minus the dot product plus the cross product, where this is in three, and that's an extra four dimensional coordinate. And um, I think it's um, curious that uh, there probably isn't a single standard advanced calculus book that does this, even though, uh, of course, there are books on quaternions by now because they are used in computer science. Um, but uh, given that you teach everyone about dot product and cross product, why don't, why don't the textbooks put them back together and teach the quaternions? Um, but that's the, that's the nice formula. And then you want to prove that this... Um, that this uh, multiplication is associative, among other things. And of course, vector cross product is almost the quaternions, except that the product of something with itself is zero. 
Um, and, um, and among other things, I'm just talking about elementary lore about the quaternions. Among other things, if you take any unit vector, let V be equal to U, and uh, suppose it uh, has dot product equal to one with itself, then you see that any unit vector squares to minus one, any unit vector, not just I, J, and K. And so there's an entire two sphere of, of vectors in three space that all square to minus one is the first consequence of that uh, way of thinking. And um, so there's a two dimensional sphere that Hello? squares. Yes. Uh, just a quick question. So about the formula you wrote, uh, is it adding this, uh, the dot product, the scalar to the individual components in the cross product? I'm sorry, so ask the question again. Oh, I was asking if you uh, the formula is adding the scalar to the individual components of the cross product. No, certainly. I say that's a fourth dimension. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's not adding to these components. You might, uh, I'm writing it as an extra scalar plus a vector. In other words, R comma, and then the vector. It's an extra fourth dimension. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, of course, that was part of the obstruction for Hamilton in inventing this. Remember, matrix algebra doesn't exist. Uh, and um, vector spaces don't exist. And, and, it, and he was trying to generalize things into three-dimensional space from what he knew about complex numbers. So, so he had to overcome uh, the idea that, uh, that there would be uh, uh, needed a fourth dimension in order to define the system. Um, I say he could have worked on the four color problem because of this system that he invented. But th this is a digression and I'll only use this one slide. But if you consider the vector cross product algebra, just the vector cross product algebra, square zero, right? Uh, and you can, it's not associative anymore. Oh, did I mention that? Uh, I thought I did. Um, vector cross product is not associative. Quaternion product is associative. So there is something to prove there. You want to see that the quaternions really are associative. Vector cross products are very non-associative. For example, I cross I is zero, cross J is still zero, but I cross I cross J is I cross K, which is minus J. Very non-associative system, um, the vector cross product. So, so you can ask the following question. Suppose I write down a formula in the vector cross product algebra, parenthesized somehow. And then I take the same set of variables in the same order, and I write it down again uh, with a different association like this, say, x, y, z, w, or x times y, z times w. And I assert that there always exists solutions to this using for x, y, z, and w only i, j, and k that are non-zero. Uh, if you would go off and prove this algebra fact for me, I would be very happy, and you should just send me the proof, and I'll deal with it. Oh, okay. Because it's equivalent to the four-color theorem. It's kind of remarkable. Uh, that algebra so, fact about so Lou, would you would you get a a hitman to to eliminate the person and then publish? Oh, I don't think we need to do that. We just steal it directly. It's it's easy enough. Um, of course, if the person was giving us trouble, I I don't know. I mean, I live in Chicago, but I haven't been checking what's available lately. A further comment on that. Um, it's an interesting thought. Um, but the more interesting thought is that, uh, that this isn't possibly a way to think about the four color theorem. But, uh, but in fact, uh, the only way I know to think about the four color theorem in relation to this is to draw a graph that corresponds to the product. I'm keeping to one slide for these comments, but you see, if you have a product, you can draw a graph. You can say uh, uh, X, Y come together in a line and come back out uh, as their product. 
and then you get a tree, uh, X, Y, Z, W, a tree on the left, and another tree from the right-hand side. And if you tie the two trees together correctly, you'll get a planar graph. And then if you color that correctly, you will find that you have solved the problem that you're looking for. So, so you can turn you turn it into a graphical expression, solve the coloring problem for the graph, and you get the solution to the algebra problem. Yes. So the question is for any association. So for of course, any, of course, I didn't say for any you only had to solve that problem. one. Yeah. Yeah. Any length product, any association. Okay. It gives you. you a big collection of graphs which turn out to be big enough by a theorem of Whitney from long ago. Um, but this has to do with the crack between associativity and non-associativity. Because you see, the product could have been in the quaternions if it didn't hit zero, right? If it never hit zero, then this product you're looking at is actually in the quaternions, right? It's only when you hit zero that you end up in the vector cross product. If you had i times j, it's going to be equal to k, and that's a quaternionic product. But then if you ended up having k times k, you'd be, you'd be going to zero because of the vector cross product. So if you contrive a product which is non-zero, then it's a quaternion product. And quaternions are associative, and so it's equal to the other one. So what you're really trying to do is to contrive products that are non-zero. And one hopes that one could somehow continue on in an algebraic line of thinking and understand something better, but I don't know how to get, I don't know how to do it without the graphs. I don't know how to understand it without the graphs. It's a nice problem. Um, so, um, what am I saying here? Just reminding you that a general quaternion is of the form A plus B U, where U is in the is in three space. And you can write that as a radius times a unit length quaternion, A and B, A squared plus B squared equals one, and then write it as R E to the U theta. Uh, and U squared is minus one. Remember, every unit length complex, every unit length vector in three space a square minus one. So it looks like complex numbers rotated around and you have conjugation and you have that uh, the conjugate of uh, the product of a, the conjugate of a product is the reverse product of the conjugates, non-commutative algebra. Um, and then you can represent rotations with quaternions. Um, and um, the way one often thinks of this is the following. You take a half angle. Um, so you take a half angle unit quaternion like this, cosine theta over two plus sine theta over two times u, u squared is minus one. u is a direction in three space. And you define a mapping from three space to itself by conjugation by the quaternion. G, Z, G inverse. Um, and then you can prove that that accomplishes an element in SO3. It accomplishes a rotation around this axis by the angle theta. So quaternions describe rotations in three space. And, and when you multiply two quaternions and collect the terms, you find the new axis for the composite which otherwise is a, is a tricky eigenvalue problem for the matrices. So, um, so this is a very pleasant property of quaternions, and one of the reasons why computer science people sometimes use quaternions. So let me see. Do I have examples that I wanted to show you? Yeah, here's a good example in case you hadn't thought about this. I say that there, there are a lot of little, sort of little elementary things in this talk. Uh, this is one I like. I like doing this example. I take a cube and I rotate it by 90 degrees around the vertical and then 90 degrees around the horizontal axis, as I've it depicted here. And uh, with labelings on the cube, you can see that the resulting composite 
is a rotation around a diagonal axis, around this diagonal, because you see, um, um, let's see, where's the axis here? H to B, right. H and B go back to where they were when you do these two rotations. And I'm just permuting things to do my rotations, right? A, B, F, E, excuse me, A, B, F, E. That's the rotation around the vertical. And A, B, C, D here becomes A, turned back that way, B, C, D, this over here. So, um, <clears throat> so you can see that the composition of two, uh, you're seeing here that a composition of two rotations around an axis is a rotation around an axis. So what will happen if you expressed it quaternionically? Well, um, as, as I said, uh, you just need to multiply the quaternions. So uh, in our problem, in our problem, uh, one of them uh, is pi over two uh, quaternion, and the other is a pi over two quaternion, one around K and one around J. Um, and I said pi over two because that's the half angle. So we write them out and we have one of them is root two over two plus K root two over two, and the other is root two over two plus J root two over two. And you multiply them together and collect your terms and you find that it's one half plus root three over two times i plus j plus k over root three. And there's the diagonal axis. So that's very nice. Um, and, and then way in back of that is the fact that every rotation is a composite of mirror reflections. And that's where the half angle is coming from because if you have two mirrors at angle theta to one another and you do first in one mirror and then in the other mirror, you get a rotation by angle two theta. So it's really uh, mirror uh, uh, reflections that are happening here. And, and reflections are easy to understand why they're working in the quaternions. You can think of this as, um, as an example being worked for you for what? Roger was talking about when he was representing reflections in his last lecture uh, in a more general situation. But here it's very nice because you see how I'm making a reflection. I take the vector perpendicular to the mirror and I don't conjugate by it. I multiply on both sides by it. KIK is I. KJK is J. But KKK is minus K. So uh, so when I do that, I, I preserve the mirror plane and I flip the direction of the perpendicular vector to the plane and accomplish the rotation, excuse me, accomplish the reflection. And then if I take a composition of two reflections, that's what turns into the conjugation and turns into the rotation. And so you can understand how that works. I don't want to go into it in more detail here. But another aspect of quaternions I do want to talk about, and that has to do with the belt trick and a little bit of topology. So this is the belt trick, a picture of it. You have a 720 degree four pi rotated belt between two concentric spheres. And you are allowed to deform it a little bit. You can do it with a belt, of course. And uh, you can make up uh, a sphere by holding on to one end and your friend holds on to the other end. But here it's anchored at the inner sphere and the outer sphere, and I'm pushing it around. I push it around the inner sphere and come back up, and it's all gone. If it's four pi rotated to begin with, that four pi rotated means... Um, uh, means exactly what I said, 720 degrees of rotation. If it was only 2 pi rotated, what will happen to it if you did the same thing? What will happen to it is that it will come back up rotated in the opposite direction. If you take a 2 pi rotation and pull it around the sphere and come back up, it will turn into a minus 2 pi rotation. Uh, and in fact, that's why this works 
mechanically speaking, because if you had a four pi rotation, you could hold part of it up in its two pi and take the other two pi and, ro- and, and pull it around the sphere and bring it back. And it became minus two pi and then they canceled each other out. Did I have a picture of that? I did, um, right? Here's two pi uh, and I made it into a little twist and then I brought it down and back up and it turned into the opposite two pi rotation. And the two pi rotation won't go away uh, under this uh, extension of braiding, um, but the four pi will. And you can make quaternions out of this um, by deciding uh, that uh, you will do the following uh, defined, uh, um, almost defined objects here. I'm going to rotate the belt uh, around a vertical by I here, like that. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, ro- oh, there it is right there. You see, I turned the little sphere, the little disc at the bottom around uh, by 180 degrees. That's I turned it around an axis perpendicular to the plane. I can turn around an axis parallel to the plane. Um, and, um, and that means grabbing the disc and turning it around like this. And that's J, um, or rather that's K. Um, well, let's see which one is which here. Oh, no, 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 I, I'm, I was doing, let's see. Yeah, that's right. Um, you should take what I wrote literally. I, I have a, an axis going to the right, and I indicated that I turned it around like a, like a right-hand rule. And if you took the little disc at the bottom and turned it, it's anchored at the top, and it's anchored on the disc, and you're just going to turn that disc. So you turn the disc around, by 180 degrees toward you, and um, and it ends up looking like this cartoon, and that is doing I and then doing J. Um, and then if you deform it a little bit, um, you see uh, that it turns into a uh, twist that looks like this, um, which cancels a little bit and leaves you with just a little bit of twist like that. And that twist at the top over on the right is taking the disc and turning it around out of the plane and back into the plane. So that's around a vertical. And in this case, uh, it's what I'm going to call minus K because I want J I to be equal to minus K. So K would be the exact same picture, but the crossing would be going the other way. Okay. Um, And then with those, with those definitions of operations on a, on a twisted band, the symmetries of the disk, the Klein four group, Z2 cross Z2, um, becomes more complex and turns into the quaternions. So the quaternions plus the belt, tra- I mean, sorry, uh, the symmetries of a disk plus the belt trick give you, the, give you a topological interpretation of the quaternions like that. So you can make a gadget like this to demonstrate the quaternions. Uh, Of course, you can uh, just take a belt. What? uh, Hello, Uh, could you go back to the previous page? I think it's all illustrated on this one, but I'll go back. Oh, I, I was just uh, a question about um, if it affects the facial expression as well, the twist uh, with the, on the horizontal, how it affected the, the mouth, I don't know. There are three directions of twist. Let's, let's use this because they're okay. all here. Yeah, you've um, gone from smiling uh, to uh, frowning. I'm sorry? You've gone from smiling to frowning. That was the comment. Oh, I oh but it's, a, it's actual... Uh, uh, it's, that's because it's frowning on the back. Ah. The disc has a smile on the front and a frown on the back. And if you rotated the disc around the vertical, it will go into a frown. That's good. So I hope it's consistent, Yes. 
Does that answer your question? Sorry, I should have said that about the disc. Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, so uh, you, 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 the quaternions can be thought of as a as a way of extending the symmetries of a disc or a, or a square, and in fact, that is what the mapping from the quaternions down to the rotation group is doing. It remember how it worked. You had uh, x goes to gx g inverse which means that g and minus g both go to the same rotation so that the and that's the double covering of su2 to so3 su2 is the unit quaternions in four space and so3 is the rotation group in three space and that is the double covering and so for every or ever, for every standard rotation in three space, you have two rotations in the quaternions, two elements in the quaternions. So this doubling is um, being illustrated by the belt trick. As I just said. Now we could go into the topology of that a little more, but I'm not going to because we wanted to go forward a bit, but let's, so that's, that's some lore about the quaternions that I happen to like. And we now want to go to the octonians. Now the octonians were almost immediately invented by Graves, I guess, 1843 also. Um, uh, and um, after um, Hamilton, um, uh, communicated his quaternion solution, um, and and the octonians are a, are a very similar construction on eight dimensional space. And uh, here's the stamp. Uh, the stamp uh, celebrates Cayley, who found them uh, a couple of years later, independently of Graves. I guess Graves didn't immediately write a paper about it. Um, so we have. Uh, the octonians and how do they work? Well, you try to add a new element to the quaternions, uh, call it capital J, so that J squared is minus one and extend it to double the algebra. You want to double the dimension and get a new algebra. So what will that look like? What will it be like to add a new element to the quaternions to get a new algebra? You would like it to have the property that JA is equal to A bar J. In other words, JA, J inverse will be equal to the conjugation uh, by analogy, right? By the way J and I behave. And you want J squared to be equal to minus one. So you try uh, a little algebra on this and see what it would be like. And uh, look at how it is. You have a J times AB, and let's suppose that it's equal to AB bar times J, right? And AB bar has to be B bar A bar. And that now let's suppose that your algebra was associative. Suppose. Suppose that you could extend from, now here I just have an algebra, non-commutative perhaps, which is associative, the A's and the B's, and it has a conjugation. And I'm trying to extend it by a J that has the property that J produces conjugation when you go across when you when you take that relation. Jx is equal to x bar J. And I'm assuming the new algebra is associative. Hmm. Okay, so I did an association here. Um, and then um, uh, and then I can bring the J across the A bar and it becomes a double bar, which is just A. And then I can reassociate. Uh, and then I can bring the J across and it becomes B double bar, which is just B. And so I have, uh, and then it's associative. So this is J B A. So I have J times A B is equal to J times B A. And then multiplying um, uh, by the inverses of J and using associativity, I have that AB is equal to BA. So my original algebra had to be commutative in order for the algebra that I got by extending with a J is associative. So this is what happened when we made the quaternions. 
we started with the complex numbers and we extended it by a J and the complex numbers are commutative and we got the quaternions which are still associative. But if you wanna go from the quaternions to a new algebra, it can't be associative. That's what this is showing you. There's no possibility for this uh, invention of graves to be associative, and it's not. So then this is the summary of how you make it in this kind of a form, which is actually, I suppose, due to Dixon. Um, Dixon, uh, uh, um, quite many years later, and I haven't got the date, um, wrote down the general construction of this kind. We're starting with an algebra, gen algebra of whose elements are A, B, C, and D, and so on. Um, and we have a conjugation, and the conjugate of a product is the reverse product of the conjugates. And the new element is squaring to minus one, and it produces conjugation. And you define multiplication in this precise way. The algebra you started with might even be non-associative, but you're only doing twofold products. Um, <clears throat> and it's got to be in this order with those conjugates. And then you find that if you started with the real numbers and apply this procedure, you will get the complex numbers. And if you start with the complex numbers and you apply this procedure, you will get the quaternions. And you start with the quaternions and you apply this procedure, you get the octonians, the Cayley numbers. And the, if you do it again, what? Yeah, the coefficient of the J on the right, should that be BC? Because- No, I don't think so. Let me check my notes. I've been known to make uh, typographical errors uh so let me check my... no B. no it's cb it's oh CB. i see okay okay yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah that that formula is correct but i have i've never been able to memorize this formula i guess maybe some mnemonics could help uh but this is called the kaylee dixon construction because you see you can keep on making algebras and people often stop at the octonians because the next time you do it it won't be uh it'll won't have um invertible elements in it it'll have non-invertible elements in it but there are more algebras you can keep on turning the crank and making more and more algebras and some people are quite enthusiastic about these algebras um uh for example there is a book um about them by francois chatelain uh, and call it entitled Qualitative Computing, and a very interesting book in case you're interested in looking into the algebras that get generated out beyond by this method. But this is, uh, let's look at the octonians for a few minutes. So if we do the octonians, let's call the thing we added L because we have I, J, and K already. Um, and then you will realize if you do that, uh, that the following works, okay? If A, B, and C are in the set I, J, K, quaternions, and we have this new L whose square is minus one, uh, then you have that L, A is minus A, L, that anti-commutes with the previous quaternions. Okay, good. Um, and then furthermore, if you take A, B quaternions, then you have L, A times L, B is B, A. L A times B is L times B A. And A times L B is L times B A. So it reverses the orders of multiplication. And those conjugates don't have to be remembered because you're going from the quaternions here and, and the conjugates, you know, the conjugate of I is equal to minus I. And so the signs are being taken care of. So if you want to go from quaternions, Stocktonians, you don't have to mem memorize the Cayley Dixon formula. You can just use this formula, which says that the new element is kind of going through the looking glass in that when you do the multiplications, the products of the quaternion parts get reversed. If you want an exercise, you can go from the Cayley Dixon formula and prove what I just said. Okay. Um, so, 
so I was pleased to realize this after a while, because that means that I don't have to um, rack my brains to remember the Kaylee Dixon formula. I just have it written on a card somewhere, but this one I can remember. Um, and then you can see some things. For example, a famous point about the Octonians is that they there are some triples that are quaternionic, and the triples form a Fano plane. Uh, that this is a, a model for projective geometry, where this triple, that triple, that triple, this triple, that triple, and this triple <coughs> are the straight lines in the geometry. And you get a quaternion triple like I times J equals K for each of these. So in other words, LJ, I, I've done it here so we could look. J times LI, all right? J times LI uh, is equal to LIJ by my, uh, re by my looking glass formula. And that's equal to LK. So J times LI is equal to LK and so on. And if you put the arrows on this, then you'd have the right orders of multiplication. So the Fano plane and, uh, and the subquaternions are not so hard to see from this point of view. Um, and then we wondered a long time ago, Jonathan Hackett and I, uh, uh, whether we could make a belt trick. Well, actually, I wondered before that, but Jonathan was a graduate student in physics at the time, and we were trying to do this. So can you make a belt trick that would handle the octonians, like the belt trick that I showed you that handles the quaternions? And um, you can do this, but it's not, uh, I don't feel it's completely satisfactory. Uh, and so this is one of those cases where uh, a preliminary paper fell into the archive and nothing more happened. Uh, and one of these days I will make a little more happen there. But it goes like this. The idea is the following. We know how to do the belt trick by turning the inner sphere. I'm going to turn the outer sphere to do L and do the other, uh, the other octonian operations. So instead of, so now I get to hold the inner sphere and turn the outer sphere, and I get to hold the uh, outer sphere and turn the inner sphere. And in the interest of time, I think I will just maybe show you some small picture of what that looks like. Here, I'm reminding you of the belt trick where the turns are on the inner sphere. Um, and uh, maybe I have a picture, yes. So you see, I could also turn the outer sphere and then I have to keep track. So I put a dot on the outer sphere and I turned it around as a whole. But then we could also hold on to the inner sphere and turn the outer sphere. And for example, this is going to be LI, turn the outer sphere, leave the inner sphere alone. And then the fact that LAB, LA times LB is the same as L times BA, that reversal of order of multiplications turns out to correspond to a kind of duality between turning the inner sphere and turning the outer sphere. And you can try following this and making it work. And there are a couple of uh, little glitches that you have to fix by allowing yourself to turn the outer sphere around to normalize something. And I'm going to stop on this because it really should be another talk. Um, but, um, but it is interesting that you can make a belt trick that handles the Octonians. And I'll come back to this and give you a better talk about it sometime, I hope. So that's the review about the Clifford, con uh, the um, Kelly Dixon construction. So now I think we have time for this, if I would get the beginning of it. So I want to tell you about an analog of the Cayley Dixon construction to get Clifford algebras. So here's what we're going to do. I start with an associative algebra with unit. I assume that it has an involution, a star star equals a, and I forgot to write on this slide that a b star is A star B star. I don't reverse the order. It's very important. Okay. That's the only quirky thing that happens at the beginning. But certainly this is true 
uh, if star was uh, defined in the complex numbers in the usual way, for example. And it's certainly true if star was the identity. So we have lots of starting places where this could be happening. All right. Now I'm going to extend it by adding a new element, eta, whose square is one instead of minus one, of course. And eta a eta is equal to a star. That's analogous to Cayley Dixon, right? Now I'm getting the conjugate. And then I take the set of a plus b etas. And I define the new conjugate to be a star minus b star eta. And now I claim that this works in the sense that a hat is now in a, is going to be an associative algebra if a was associative. So this will go on forever. It's not like the Cayley Dixon construction coming into problems uh, with associativity. It remains associative after you've done it. And you see, we've added that Clifford kind of element. And let's see how it works. So, um, so what's the multiplication? Um, oh, I forgot to tell you. Um, oh, I didn't forget to tell you. I told you, but, um, but you have to look. Uh, what is the conjugate of eta? Well, you take a equal to zero and b equal to one, and you deduce that the conjugate of eta is minus eta. Okay, so the new element conjugates to minus itself. It's very analogous to what happened with the quaternions. And then what's the multiplication in general? Well, it follows from what we said, but I've written it out. Um, you get ac, you get ad eta, you get b a to c, but b a to c is b c star eta. So b c star. And you get b a to d eta, and that's equal to b a to d eta. And the a to d eta is d star, so you get b d star. And so there's the product formula for this algebra. Now we can check that it's associative. Um, I've done one check here. Um, take this guy. Um, a eta times B eta times C. A eta times B eta is, remember, A to B eta is B star. So this is A B star times C. And, uh, and we started the underlying algebra is associative, so that's A B star C. On the other hand, A eta times B eta times C. B eta times C is B C star eta. Now we have an A eta times uh, something eta, which is equal to a times the conjugate of that, and that remember now the conjugate of a product is the same ordered product of the conjugates, and we arrived at the same result. So all of uh, so the so the the fact that it inherits associativity is being driven by the fact that I tell you beforehand that the con that the um, conjugate of a product is the same ordered product of the conjugates. And this is also inherited. So, uh, there, so that's the construction, very simple. And, and since it induces associativity, it means that indeed you can see that we're going to be getting uh, lots of algebras with lots of elements whose square is equal to one. But what about their relations among themselves? Do we really get Clifford product? Well, let's just do it a few examples. Here, start with the real numbers. And we have r star is equal to r for all r. And so I'll write it, I'll write my, uh, my hat algebra for the reals as t plus x sigma instead of a lambda or eta. And sigma squared is one and sigma star is minus sigma. And then the conjugate of this is t minus x sigma. And if you multiply uh, one of these times its conjugate, you get t squared minus x squared. And this is the Minkowski plane. And, um, and this is often represented by a single Pauli matrix like that. What if we took the, so that, that's a good example. And what if we take uh, our hat hat? Now we have two things. We have A plus B lambda, but we have the sigma. So this is of the form T plus X sigma plus Y lambda plus Z times sigma lambda, since we do have that as well product of sigma and lambda. Sigma squared is one, lambda squared is one. Sigma lambda squared is sigma lambda sigma, but lambda sigma lambda is sigma star. 
and sigma star is minus sigma, and so you get minus one. This is characteristic of what happens in Clifford algebra is you have a sigma and a lambda and, and you get that uh, the product of two, uh, whose squares are one and then you get the product of them and it has square minus one. This is almost um, uh, space time, but you might really prefer to have these all square to one and then you need to multiply sigma lambda times an i in order to do that. And then you'll get the quaternions. That's one way of getting the, um, I'm sorry, you'll get the poly matrices. And if you multiplied each of these by a commuting i, then you would get the quaternions. And you can get space time at the second level like that. Now, what about a, an arbitrary sigma and a lambda in two successive productions of this construction? Then you'd have lambda sigma lambda is equal to sigma star, which is minus sigma. So that says that lambda sigma is minus sigma lambda or sigma lambda plus lambda sigma is zero. So you see, we are getting the Clifford relations. And so if we were to take an algebra and do it n times, then we would have added to that algebra um, a bunch of lambda i's, which have the Clifford relations. And so this is, generating Clifford algebras from a given non from a given associative algebra in this way. If we started with complex numbers, then we would add one more lambda squared and lambda star is minus lambda. And we already have that I star is minus I, I squared is minus one. Lambda I lambda is I star by definition minus i. So lambda i is minus i lambda. They anti-commute. So now looking at the generators, we have one i lambda and lambda i. i squared is minus one. Lambda squared is plus one. But lambda i squared is plus one. And so while i were originally was the commuting i, when we augmented into this algebra, it became non-commuting with the others. And you see that this is the same as the two element split quaternions kind of Clifford algebra that we were making back here, back here, 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 this one with a lambda and a sigma both squaring to one. Only when we started with the complex numbers, we got this guy squares to one, that guy squares to one, and the i, which we started with, squares to minus one. So we have that c hat is r hat hat. And you can do more exercises, of course. For example, you might want to do it three times, and then you have somebody generated by three um, and doing the usual Clifford relations. And then if you were to take mu lambda, tau mu, and lambda tau, they all square to minus one, and you get the quaternions. So you can pick up the quaternions from a three-element um, generated Clifford algebra like that. This is all Clifford algebra lore, but thinking of doing this construction kind of puts some of these examples into a framework. And now I'm almost, I'm, well, we have enough time to say a few more things. The idea for this construction for me came from an attempt to formalize the following funny idea uh, that I, I want to think of the square root of minus one as an kind of an oscillation between plus one and minus one, kind of vibrating between plus one and minus one. And the intuitive idea that the square of it is equal to minus one is that when you multiply it by itself, one of them gets flipped from the other one by a little time step in the oscillation. So this is going from plus to minus but the other one after you multiply them is going from minus to plus relative to it. And then whenever this is plus, this one's minus. And whenever this one's minus, that one's plus and it multiplies to minus one. Well, that's a kind of temporal idea. How can I make algebra out of it? Well, I could say, okay, whatever I mean by that, I mean that the bracket X, the vibrating thing, multiplied by another one will be equal to the non-vibrating x times the conjugate of the other, where the conjugate of the vibration from plus one to minus one is the vibration from minus one to plus one. So I need to have a conjugation in my algebra, and I should have a product like this. 
and I want to get an associate of algebra out of this. So now I give up the temporality and say, I have a, I start with an algebra. It's just like what we just did. Start with an associative algebra with an involution such that A, B star is A star, B star. Extend it to a new algebra consisting of entities A plus bracket B and figure out how to make it associative. And now I tell you that if I use these rules, it will be associative. In other words, I wanted the first rule. And then I try to figure out how to multiply the others to make it associative. And I find out that this is what I need. Bracket X times Y is bracket X, Y star. But X times bracket Y is just bracket X, Y. It, it works. It's associative. You can check. Like, for example, here, I'm checking, but I won't bother you with dragging you through the in through the algebra but now if you if you're given that if you believe that then you want to find out well maybe i could get rid of this funny bracket and make it into pure algebra well uh i can consider bracketing one right and if I and then according to the rules of this algebra that has been in that has been displayed for you here, the square of eta is one. Okay, so eta squared is one. Now what about x times one? Well, according to the rules, x times bracket one is x bracket x times one star, which is just one. Um, and and that's bracket x. So x times one is bracket x. So bracket X is X times eta, and we're getting to remove the brackets. And if I multiply eta times bracket X, I get one X, which is one X star. So eta times X eta is X star. And now you're looking at the construction that I told you about. So I told you about the construction at the algebra level where we had the eta extended, but you see that in fact, the, it's it's to me intellectually interesting that this general construction that is making Clifford algebras comes out of trying to formalize the idea of the square root of minus one as a little buzzing oscillation. Um, you don't have to take that seriously or take it at all if you don't want to. I've formulated it in such a way that you could start algebraically with this curious idea of making an associative algebra with this rule or just starting with the uh, etas and extending um here's here's the kind of example i was thinking about dynamically i'm thinking about this so here's my base algebra it consists of pairs of real numbers and a b star is b a that's the involution and the products of these are component-wise. So it's just the direct sum of the reals with itself. But I'm thinking of the AB as being an oscillation, and the conjugate is the reversal point of view of it. So um, two views on one oscillation. And then you see uh, eta times AB times eta in the hat construction is BA. And you have another element, E, 1 minus 1, who squares to 1. And a to e eta is equal to minus one, one, which is minus e. So e squared is one, eta squared is one, e eta, they Clifford one another, and you're getting a little Clifford algebra out of this. So the single oscillatory um, algebra A is, is giving rise to Clifford algebra. And furthermore, there's another interesting facet of this, how would you represent this algebra that I've just told you about with eta squared equal to one? Well, in this case, a typical element of it is AB plus CD eta. And I'm going to represent this for you in the following way. I'm going to take it to a two by two matrix, AB on the diagonal and CD on the anti-diagonal. I mean that eta is the permutation. And E eta then is E eta being a diagonal matrix times, uh, I mean, a, a regular diagonal matrix with one minus one on the diagonal multiplied by the permutation matrix is the one minus one. And now you're looking at a square root of minus one that is quite normal uh, in two by two matrix algebra. Um, and so all of this fits together into matrix algebra. 
And in fact, if you were to take another turn uh, and say, well, what if I did triples or quadruples? And what if I let go of involutions and considered symmetries, other permutations, then you find yourself uh, representing any matrix algebra, any n by n matrix algebra you care to in many ways. For example, a cyclic permutation on three, um, and you will find yourself reproducing uh, three by three matrix algebra out of this idea. So it goes in some other algebra directions as well. So that's the picture of this uh, uh, analog Cayley Dixon construction. And I see that I'm out of time, but maybe I can just make a little jump and say something about the physics. Uh, you see, oh, I'm sorry. I said what I wanted to say about the physics is on a slide here. Sorry. Part of it. Sorry. Let's go again. There. One more slide. Uh, why is that too large? There. Okay. So let's take uh, a small Clifford algebra here, alpha and beta square to one, alpha beta plus beta alpha zero. There's another algebra, which is well known in physics called fermion algebra. In fermion algebra, you have operators whose squares are zero and the anti-commutator of them is equal to one. Um, and you might think of this as um, representing, in its way, it represents some principles you know about electrons. Pauli principle says you can't have two fermions in the same state. That's squaring to zero. Um, this psi, psi dagger can be an anti particle. It's really the creator of a particle and psi is the creator of the anti particle. Um, and then the commutator uh, uh, sum, the, the sum of uh, the anti commutator sum being equal to one is uh, is like saying that the, well, that's what you can um, you can have you can have one or the other in those forms of creation and annihilation. That's a little I, I don't know how to give an a, a, an obvious intuitive interpretation for that, but that but these become the creation and annihilation operators for fermions in quantum field theory. So this is a different algebra seems. Oh, but in fact, it can be rewritten in terms of Clifford algebra. And this is the rewrite. I'm going to let psi be equal to alpha plus i beta over two and psi dagger to be alpha equal to alpha minus i beta over two. Try it out. This is the Clifford algebra, try it out. Psi squared, four times psi squared is equal to alpha plus i beta times alpha plus i beta, which is alpha squared minus beta squared plus i times alpha beta plus beta alpha. But alpha beta plus beta alpha zero with Clifford, alpha squared is equal to beta squared Clifford, so it's zero. So you see, and then what about psi plus psi dagger? Well, psi plus psi dagger is just alpha, so it's square to one. But psi plus psi dagger, when you square it, these uh, the end terms, the squared terms go away, and you get the the anti commutator. So you see, um, it says that the uh, creation annihilation algebra for fermion is uh, naturally written in terms of a Clifford algebra, and vice versa. If you if you actually wanted to do it starting with an arbitrary algebra like this, you would take um, psi plus psi dagger um, and call that alpha, and you would take psi minus psi dagger and call that i beta, right? Uh, um, you would so divided by i and and then you would verify that the fermion algebra implies that the alpha and the beta that i just described are clifford so clifford and and fermion algebra are 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 all together but now if you were speculating you might think well hmm does that mean that an electron could be a combination of two other particles that are described by alpha and beta and some people thought so, think so, 
and those are called Majorana fermions. They would be particles by another story that I can't tell you in, in minus five minutes uh, that uh, would be their own antiparticles. And, and these particles become particle and antiparticle through the conjugation. And, and that would mean that an electron, if you could somehow look at it more closely, would be a pair of things. And if you had a row of electrons, then they would be each thought of as little pairs of things, and they could be repaired like this. And then there would be odd men out at the end of the string of electrons. And you could try to do an experiment where the electrons were forced into a string by being in a nanowire, by being in a very thin wire, and being very cold and try to get a correlation between the ends that would correspond to the way these would be pairing up. And Kataev wrote such a paper about the theory of it back in 2000. And Ivanov wrote another paper around the same time showing that braiding happens at the Majorana level, that there are interesting braid group representations at the Majorana level using the Clifford algebra. And then more recently, people have tried to... Um, uh, detect such a thing. See, Majorana fermions in nanowires by pairing in this way and trying to get a correlation between the ends. Um, and for a while, this was happening around 2012, 14. It looked like the experiments were really saying that something was there. And then more recently, people have been skeptical about whether these experiments are showing anything at all. So it's up in the air. It's speculative at the present time whether uh, you should think of electrons as decomposed as into real entities that are Majorana fermions. But um, it's a very interesting speculation. And to finish, and I must finish, the braid group representation looks like this. You take a row of Majoranas. This is these are guys that satisfy the Clifford algebra, and you take one plus ai plus one times ai divided by root two, and the inverse of it is this, and they satisfy the braid group. So you get a braid group representation, and then if you let them act by conjugation on themselves, an old quaternionic theme, you find that things behave like this. <clears throat> where, where if you exchange two Majoranas, one of them gets a sign, a phase, and the other one doesn't, and it behaves just like a belt put between them, like the belt trick that we started with, so that we come back around to the belt trick, somewhat generalized and made more specific into a braid group representation. And we could go on from there to talk about how this is working, but I'm going to stop. Well, well uh, thanks, Lou. Um, are there any questions? Uh, if I could just add a little minuscule, um, the, the reason why you've got divisors of zero is because you're taking, you're adding a square. You mean in, in beyond the Octonians? Uh, yeah. But, yeah, oh, sure. Be, well, in the the last but one slide you did when you when you you, you got a, a a psi squared equals naught or something. Oh, uh, in the fermion algebra, the fermion, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because you're adding, you're taking something and you're adding uh, a square root of something which already exists. You know, I mean, it, I'm adding a word, commuting square root of minus one, so I'm perturbing things by uh, seriously, yes. But I mean, it, it, you know, I'm tensoring with the complex numbers, the, 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 the Clifford algebra, right. Um, anyway, that was a mini contribution. Anybody? Thank you. Right. Got Good a major point. contribution. <laughs> <laughs> so um, SL2Z3 is isomorphic to the binary tetrahedral group. And um, the, the Fano plane has something to do with projective geometry. 
Yes. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you can maybe try to figure out an extension of SL2Z3 that uh, captures the, um, uh, uh, what is it, the eight dimensional algebra. Interesting question. So what you're saying is, what if we took sub-algebras of the quaternions, like yeah. binary tetrahedral group or binary yeah. icosahedral group, and then asked, is there a corresponding sub-algebra of the octonians? Perfectly yeah. natural question. After all, the quaternions are repeated over and over again inside the octonians. Yeah. So, so it's it's certainly there that way, but something a little more interesting may be happening too. Well, um, I think I've mentioned this to you before. I, I'm very unsatisfied with that picture of the Fano plane. I think that there's a nicer picture if you look at um, uh, specifically a projective plane in Z three cross Z three. I mean, you there. There's a picture there. I just haven't done it yet. Um, but well, let's connection... see. Let's slow down here. Why? Why are you dissatisfied with the uh, final plane as it stands? I, mean, I don't know. It just—it's one of those things that I just—it's a feeling you have. Yeah, it's—it it looks too much like something out of a Harry Potter illustration. I think. <laughs> oh, maybe because <laughs> a wizard's hat. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, is, is it because one of the straight lines is a circle? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that doesn't help. No. Right. Well, projective geometers don't distinguish between circles and straight lines sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but do you well, have a? Do you actually, do you actually have a? Are a not a, that a, easy a, either. I mean, they 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 do like. Uh, two points here and one point over there. So, um, but somehow they're more accessible. Uh, but do you, do you have a, do you actually have a model of projective geometry that you're thinking about in relation to SL2Z3? No, I just know that, I just know the isomorphism between those two groups. What was the isomorphism again? SL2Z3 is isomorphic to? To um, binary tetrahedral group. I see. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, well, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something there. Yeah. There's, a, there's already a lot there, right? Like the fact that the finite subgroups of SL3 are related to a whole lot of things about Lie algebras, right? Um, yeah. McKay, McKay correspondence, right? Right. So. Well, I. So I we should think, talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. We should, but maybe, maybe in another session because. Sure. We're way over time. And people have to go off and do things. <laughs> Like lunch, right? Or yeah, whatever. Like lunch. Supper, actually. Or are, we're meeting in an hour, aren't we again? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. um, give a round of applause. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was very Thank good. you. Very good. Um, just a, one last important announcement. There won't be a talk next week. Okay. But hopefully there will be one the week after. Uh, but I'll send round details to everyone. Okay, so I'll stop now. Okay, and thanks okay. again to uh, Lou and Thank thanks you. everybody else for coming. <laughs>